Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome hey. back to uh, Cannabis Business Live with Craig Aronoff and Travis Copenhaver from the Cannabis Legal Group. We're with you here on a late Friday afternoon. A lot of stuff has happened this week in Michigan in the medical marijuana law, so hopefully you'll have some questions to join us. Um, certainly, if you're watching this uh, as a maybe as a video afterwards, we know it's late in the day, we might not get as many live viewers as we would hope, but if you do, please ask questions. Um, you can reach out to us through our website, you can reach out to us through Facebook on, at Cannabis Legal Group, um, check out our municipalities page, we're constantly updating it. But what we wanted to do today was kind of just bring a quick synopsis, a summary of what's been going on in the state of Michigan this week. Big week for a lot of people with the, you know, the February 15 deadline is to yesterday. Right. Um, and two major cities in the, in the state of Michigan created their own chaos, so we want to kind of address those with the city of Warren and the city of uh, Detroit. So um, first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about this February 15 um, date because we've right. seen a lot of people use this word deadline. But what does yeah. it really mean for businesses? In sure, Michigan? and I've seen a few news articles where the tagline is deadline to spit applications. Right. For a very small class of operators. So effectively what the February 15th deadline was, was if you are trying to take advantage of Emergency Rule 19, the right to temporarily, temporarily operate while you're seeking your state license, you had to submit your Step 1 application uh, through the state application process by yesterday at 11.59 p.m. Um, if you failed to do that or you're attempting to operate without a license, you now have no protection under the MMFLA to do so, and you are operating at your own risk illegally. So. Well, and, and so what the state did, just to kind of give a brief uh, update as to it, you know, these old dispensaries that were operating that are now looking to become provisioning centers, some communities had kind of authorized them to stay open, so mm -hmm. now they have that attestation. Um, and yesterday was a deadline, so there was a lot of, you know, people screaming to get this in in terms of just, you know, breaks on, running into the into the uh, Laura office to do it. Um, what we can say is, of course, that this deadline has come and gone, and our biggest piece of advice right now to any operating entity out there that did not actually get their attestation or finish their Phase 1 application timely is you must shut down. Mm -hmm. um, there's no question about it. We've seen many indications that the DEA, along with, say, the city of Detroit, Wayne County, as well as some other law enforcement agencies throughout the state, are going to be targeting entities that were not properly attested and uh, submitted on time. So this is the, the major caution right now, is don't be one of those that get yourself busted for operating right. illegally at this point. Um, so that, I think that's very important. Thank now, you, <laughs> but what that what that doesn't mean though is if you're a newcomer and sorry we're doing this at a different time of day than we usually do so we're dealing with some sun all of a sudden. Um, but if you're just a, an applicant, you're you're new to the process, you weren't operating under the 2008 laws before. There's no deadline. You continue doing what you're doing. Take your time. Put a quality application together. Submit the materials accurately. Uh, you can submit that state license anytime in the future. So there's no deadline for that. The only deadline that was from yesterday was for those temporarily temporary operators. That's right. And so if you saw those news articles, you know, take it for a grain of salt. If it doesn't apply to you, don't worry about it. Yep. So let's circle back now. When, you know, the two major cities in the state of Michigan, both of them, uh, both the city of Detroit, which I believe is the largest, city of Warren, I think is the third, third largest. It is the third largest in the It's quickly becoming closest to the first largest, actually. It <laughs> may overtake others soon. Um, they've had a large marijuana population in both of these cities for the last several years because both of them had operating caregiver ordinances. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of interest in it. And the planning committee, and I'll deal with Warren first, um, why don't we talk about that? So just talk yeah. about what it was and where we're, where we're at now and I'll so, tell me what happened. So prior to the MMFLA, um, the city of Warren had uh, some licensing you could go through to operate as a caregiver kind of operation. Um, you could effectively be in zoning districts in their industrial districts, and there were some buffers in place. I think there were about 500 feet for most things, including residential use. Yep. Um, and a lot of caregivers operating out of non-residential locations uh, went through the process and warrant to, to get whatever local permitting was allowed so that they could operate their caregiver patient conduct in those locations. Yeah. Um, and that was basically you know, what was the deal in Warren. And then the MMFLA came along. Um, and the city of Warren started working on a draft ordinance. Um, and yeah. then 
So in essence, we, we have these caregiver centers that will allow for up to seven caregivers to share a single facility with a facility manager. And anyone who went through the process knows Warren was very stringent. It was a long, drawn-out inspection process. Each step of the way was a mountain to climb. It did not make it easy to just do this. Mm -hmm. So those entities that went through and got permission and got licensed and permitted and have done all their, you know, their inspections, they've been waiting back now for this MMFLA ordinance. Well, in July of this past year, in 2017, the city council referred to the planning committee to make a recommendation for his new zoning ordinance. Well, that was brought to light on Monday of this past week. So the planning committee held its uh, hearing. Yeah, and um, I, I've gotten this question a lot. So, so effectively, they didn't recommend that it passed. That's a bad thing, right? Not really. Okay, well, why not? So <laughs> first and foremost, the, the publication of this ordinance was never made. So there's some dispute and some concerns over how it was done in the color of darkness. And a few of us got our hands on that draft ordinance. It was available. If you walk into the city, it was sitting on a county. We're not allowed to make copies. Um, it, was, it was supposedly published, but nobody's seen the actual publication of that. Notwithstanding, it had three major, major flaws in it. Aside from maybe some nominal things, the three major things were, number one, it was eliminating its caregiver ordinance altogether. So everybody was previously expect, you know, um, doing it under this old law would suddenly have no ordinance whatsoever to continue to operate. Number two, it was going to reduce or exchange, I'm sorry, increase the buffer from 500 feet to 1,000 feet. And lastly, it was going to eliminate co-location and actually make it a prohibited use activity in the city wow. of Warren. And just as a reminder for everyone, co-location is when you put different license types on the same parcel. So your growers, your processors, your provisioning centers, when one or more of those share a location, we call that co-locating. Yeah. So if you wanted to do vertically integrated under that draft, you couldn't do a grower and a processor in the same location. That, that is correct. And, and, you know, and when... Comments were brought up during the course of the hearing on Monday. There, first, there were a number of people who, you know, came to discuss the fact that their caregiver building um, was, you know, 600, 700 feet from residences, and suddenly they were being buffered out arbitrarily. They did all the work; they were inspected. Nobody had any issue with them, and now all of a sudden, you know, they have seven caregivers in there operating potentially. So they have ample plans to meet a Class A or Class B license potentially. And now all of a sudden they're somehow, you know, not able to utilize it in the way it has. Another important point to point out about the city of Warren is that the actual inventory of commercial property in that industrial space, this industrial property is gone. Like everything's been bought up and gobbled up that was 500 feet away from residences. So a lot of investment has made, a lot of increase in prices has occurred. And now arbitrarily this planning commission was going to reduce and change that buffer from five to a thousand and limit this huge ring of potential businesses, including many of whom had already been permitted. And so the council listened to a number of people speak for about an hour. And ultimately, um, as the council is supposed to do, is it votes to either recommend or not recommend the ordinance as described to city council. So at the basically the desire of the room and everybody in it, the uh, council or the planning committee voted to not recommend this ordinance. Right. And what was the reaction in the room? You were there, right? Everybody stood up and applauded, actually. So, so. so well, if you, did, if you didn't know better, and honestly, when someone asked me the first time, it sounded like that's not a good thing. Um, you have to really dig into some of these municipal activities sometimes because in this case, you know, what that's going to allow the city to do is, is come back to the drawing board and, and maybe put a better document together. Well, what will happen is, is that as we walk through the rest of the process, so the planning committee did its job or tried to do its job, did it poorly in our opinion. Um, now what will happen is, is at the next planning commission meeting, they're going to approve the agenda and the minutes. So if these minutes get approved, absent some objection at that time, then it'll move forward to the next available city council meeting as being not recommended, but here's the ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, as has happened in Ann Arbor and Bay City as good examples, the city council can actually make changes and make amendments to the ordinance to comply with its intentions. Okay. So it will listen to the minutes, it will have the opportunity, because Warren was online, so it's a video, but they may also have the um, transcripts of it. They'll read all the complaints and all the concerns um, uh, I think a very valid concern that I raised was the, you know, competitive disadvantaged operators operating Warren if they can't co-locate their processor and their grow licenses. 
they'd actually have to put their product to market, maybe more expensive than elsewhere. So this is one point, I think, on the economics that the city council should be considering. Um, as they do, they hopefully will make those amended changes. A um, good example, again, in Bay City was they added from five provisioning centers to 50. <laughs> in Ann Arbor, we got the zoning ordinance to change from a 1,000-foot buffer to 600 feet. And then more, and our goal would be to get it to move from the 1,000 that they wrote in this non-recommended draft to 500 where it used to be and allow all these buildings to prosper the way they intended. Right. So that's the short, long version of Warren. Is that right? The short, long version? Uh, we um, were trying to keep it short. Yeah, right. well, here we go. Still in about 10 minutes, <laughs> so go figure. Um, but, you know, a, as we see these things change, of course, it, it's giving us a good reflection of how the communities are reacting to it. And these two large communities are very important to our, our state. Um, that brings us to Detroit that had a, kind of an, its impasse. So why don't you, you know, help uh, anyone who's not as familiar with the city of Detroit. Let's talk about the history just briefly. Sure. They, they had the caregiver law. We had this ordinance. Right. So, so uh, a few years ago, uh, prior to the MMFLA again being put in place, similar to Warren, uh, the city of Detroit came up with, with what was called the Medical Marijuana Caregiver Center Ordinance. Uh, and it was a very restrictive set of zoning rules you had to comply with in order to be in what we hear as the green zone um, or a location where you could have, again, a non-residential patient caregiver conduct, a.k.a. where all the dispensaries in Detroit uh, needed to be. Uh, that was a very restrictive set of rules. Uh, you needed to be a thousand feet away from almost everything, schools, churches, liquor stores, uh, arcades, libraries, daycares, daycares. Uh, an arbitrary list of unverified public housing addresses the city put together somehow. Yeah, right. um, and drug effectively, drug-free zones, right. Yeah. And effectively, uh, all the almost 300 operators in Detroit all of a sudden found themselves uh, outside of compliance with a new set of rules the city put together. Um, it became a, a giant mess of, of argument, litigation, application work for almost a year and a half. And eventually, 60 or so uh, people found themselves in some sort of approval with Detroit because they were lucky enough to be in these green zones. And pretty much everyone else uh, got shut down either through this application process or through losing lawsuits with the city. Um, then, uh, afterwards, the MMFLA had happened kind of at the tail end of this big dispute. And the city of Detroit, uh, being in giant kind of mess with uh, marijuana already, uh, was dragging its feet about whether or not it was going to participate in the M MMFLA. So uh, a, a group put together a ballot initiative, got the signatures to get on the ballot, and then put it to the voters of Detroit. Uh, two ballots. One uh, was to have the city of Detroit participate in the MMFLA, opt into the program. And the second was to define the locations uh, that different license types could be. Uh, both ballots in November passed by about 60% of Detroit voters. So great. Everything's looking good. Uh, not so much. What happened after that? So in essence, um, as we get into 2018, um, what we've really been seeing is, is that the city had some chaos. So we had initially there was a lawsuit filed by a business that was not previously approved under the old law. And then we also had a group of citizens that were trying to say that they don't like marijuana at all in the city. So they sued the ballot initiative, which was called the Citizens for Reform of Cannabis. Uh, or sensible reform of cannabis, I think is a better description. Um, so they sued the citizens group. And so those cases were pending, and they brought in the city as a third party into those actions. Um, at today's hearing, so let's just kind of fast forward, though, many of the suits that were brought have not been successful up till now. Um, I, I should actually add one more kind of fact pattern to it before I jump into today's. Um, the city was granted summary disposition in one of the actions, meaning that they actually had the case denied on behalf of the business seeking to apply for a license under the new law. That business appealed to the Court of Appeals last week. The Court of Appeals ruled since there's no injunction in place and it has been ruled unconstitutional, the city has to begin taking applications. So that was like Thursday of last week. On Monday of this week, city council voted to put a moratorium in place. So the moratorium now says, well, you might be able to file your application. We're not obligated to do anything with it. So now right. if you file it, it'll just sit there and apply. Just a pause. A moratorium is basically a pause where if something is on their books in some way, shape, or form, it's just that we're not going to start utilizing that for a set period of time. It was 180 days in this case. So this moratorium is created, and we all know about the February 15 date that we already described. People are running up to trying to get these attestations to operate. 
And then all the while, there's been a hearing schedule for the 16th on the merits of the cases as to whether or not the ballot initiative was valid. Right. So that happened this morning. So we, the chaos being, you know, we have a court of appeals saying you have to take licenses or applications. The city issuing its moratorium. The 15th comes to pass. 60, I think, two or three businesses were approved um, from their prior zoning. And so, now, those, so, so let's back up that too. And again, when people ask us what's the deal in Detroit, this is why it's difficult to explain that to them. It's been a mess. It continues to be a mess. So effectively, those ballots did a few things. It effectively repealed that MMCC caregiver center ordinance. However, about 60 or so, a little more, uh, got approval under that. So what the city of Detroit did decide to do is grant the temporary attestations, Rule 19 temporary operating permission, to the ones that did get final approval. And those operators had, until last night, to submit their uh, state applications. That's However, right. anyone who was caught in the mix uh, where they were either challenging a ruling the city made that didn't allow them to get those permissions or wanted to start engaging in the program now as, a, um, as an MMFLA applicant, no one's been allowed to do anything. If you weren't one of those 60 that got through this, the previous set of rules, uh, we were kind of waiting to see when, every, when the dust settles, when new applications will start to be accepted. Yeah, and so <laughs> take a breath after all that, right? I mean, it's it's truly chaotic what happened. Um, ultimately, though, we do have a number of businesses that were operating that are, you know, kind of having to shut down, and that goes back to the advice from before. If you're not one of those on the list, and you need to shut down. So today, what the the judge did was he effectively said the citizen, um, the two citizens who are trying to overturn the ballot initiative on their own, don't have standing to pursue that. The business that was denied a BZA approval does not have standing to challenge the initiatives. However, the city does. And so at today's hearing, <coughs> the judge realigned all the parties and is now allowing the city of Detroit to be the plaintiff suing against the defendant, which is the Citizens for Sensible Reform. The group that put the ballot together. Exactly. Right. And so in essence, the city is now in the position to be challenging the validity of those two ordinances. And their argument is effectively that this is a, the, the police power should have been rested in city council. I think their argument is kind of weak on that one. I mean, we can go round and round, but generally speaking, you can create your own police power by a voter initiative. Um, on the other hand, the zoning where they, they were challenging whether or not the Home uh, Rule Act as well as the Land Enabling Act, Michigan. which, yeah. MZEA, yeah. Yeah. Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. That's right. Yeah. Um, that, that what these do is they actually you know give authority to the community to do its own zoning and that way the community as a whole can actually decide what choices it makes now the city is going to try to say that one or both of these um, ordinances are no longer valid and in doing so it's putting into chaos what properties are actually going to be available it also actually negates the opportunity of the city to apply and take licenses and process those. Even if we know that there's going to be green compliant areas under the old rules, which at a worst will still be green. So it won't get worse for those operators like they tried to do in Warren, but we might expand it. Now instead of having a thousand foot buffer, for 500 feet is there and we can actually increase the inventory. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the direction this is going to go. Um, if we were to ask the city attorneys, they would tell us that ballot initiative B was for sure not valid and That's unconstitutional. Yeah. That's right. So thank you for yeah, that. No problem. Um, saying that the zoning was something that should be overturned and that the city needs to do a moratorium to kind of fix the process, set it up properly, <coughs> and then allow for an online application process along with the map, just like they had before. And, you know, despite whatever challenges Detroit has, the way they did marijuana before was actually relatively easy to engage and work through the city process. Um, and I think we need to set this up so we can do that again. It might have taken a little time and you had to dot your eye and cross your T, but there was process. Right. And, you know, the challenge that used to be in Detroit was if you're in the green zone, you're great. You're good. It was all about finding qualifying property. That's right. Now, no one knows what qualifying property is going to be. You, you could be in a green zone and if they change rules on you, you might no longer be compliant because the rules are up in the air. Um, and the zoning rules we're talking about are things like buffers, zoning districts, caps on number of licenses. Um, so in Detroit, under the ballot initiative, which again, I'll remind everyone, passed by the voters of the city of Detroit by 60%, um, 
uh, hopefully the city of Detroit's sensitive to that. Yeah. Uh, it basically allowed unlimited licenses. You had to be in zoning districts for most of the license types. And then provisioning centers were the only ones with buffers. They had to be a certain distance away from other provisioning centers and a certain distance away from schools and churches. That's very lenient compared to the zoning regimes other municipalities have set up for marijuana. So, you know, everyone was looking at Detroit after those ballots thinking, that's great. The city's going to get all these new investments from businesses because before we had patients and caregivers. The businesses that were operating in Detroit were basically dispensaries. But now we can have things like processors, testing labs, transportation companies, uh, cultivation operations, private business to business and business service businesses that have no sidewalk character impact on, um, you know, neighborhoods. They're basically industrial uses. Right. So even those businesses are, are, are kind of up in the air right now because Detroit had a problem with dispensaries. I, I don't think anyone can, can deny that. And provisioning centers are, are there um, in the mix, and that's why Detroit's really kind of trying to figure out what the hell they want to do right now. But what's, what's also unfortunate is everyone who wants to make these investments in the city of Detroit has no guarantee that the buildings they want to invest in are going to be included. Yeah, I think that that does create a lot of challenge. And we've seen since the ballot initiative was announced, a lot of these properties that were five outside of 500 feet, but inside 1,000 feet from what would be restricted uses, schools, churches, whatnot, um, you know, a lot of them had deals pending. A lot of inventory got gobbled up. A lot of people took some risk and said, all right, that eventually be green. So let's, let's pursue that. Um, you know, and so there was always a caution. If you came to us at Cannabis Legal Group, we always had that yellow flag up of, we got to wait this out. And if it's not a thousand feet under the old ordinance, we're, we're giving you the cautionary tale on it. Um, and it's proving itself, at least right now, to say, we it's going to take a probably six, seven, eight months. I don't know how long this litigation is going to go. I'll give Judge Colombo credit. He is trying to stay on task. He understands that the timing of all this is causing a lot of chaos and flux. He was uh, critical of all parties today. He gave nobody any quarter. You know, he was just outright, just short and kept everybody on task. But nonetheless, he tabled his uh, ruling pending these, uh, you know, amended um, pleadings that are got to come in. So the city's got to file its complaint, lay out and draw out its arguments properly as to why these valid issues are, you know, not valid. Um, he did mention, too, because there was a challenge to it before the vote. And he ruled at that time that the vote should happen. And the analogy that I've used is a, is a football analogy for anyone who watches football, that you know if there's a fumble that happens and the guy picks up the ball and runs to the end zone, if the referee blows the whistle and stops the play and it was a valid fumble, they stop the score. On the other hand, if they let him score and realize it wasn't a valid fumble, no harm, no foul. In this instance, it was a better choice to let the vote happen and then deal with the consequences and to stop the vote if it were potentially illegal, be proven that it wasn't, and then still have to go through a vote. It would probably right. would have been a huge financial There would have been no way to know what the outcome of that vote would have been, and they can't put a special election together. Even if they would, yeah. it wouldn't have been the same voter turnout that it, the normal election would have rendered. So, so that was the correct move. Even if that That's ballot right. initiative was 100% wrong, um, you can't just all of a sudden win your court case and have a vote from the city again. So, right. so I mean, he did what the best solution was given the circumstances. And, and, and you know, who's to say it would have been voted positive? I think we all knew it would be, right. but you know, in the end, it may have been voted down, and then it was all for not anyway. But and there are two ballots too. Maybe one's correct and one isn't. I mean, the zoning one is the one that's a very interesting legal topic to look into because it's coming into conflict with the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, arguably. Uh, that's what the city's there's, arguing. There was actually a really, the argument that the uh, citizen group put on uh, uh, that, you know, I think it has some, I look forward to seeing how it develops. I mean, my legal mind is intrigued. My business mind wants this over with so we can get right. working. Um, right. But the legal argument from the other side is, is they were never challenging the uses in each of the districts. All they were saying is the same districts apply. We're just going to add a marijuana use to it. So we're not changing any of the previous zoning. Right. Um, now, the argument there is, well, there's a permitted use and then there's a conditional use. And so by adding a new conditional use, you are, in fact, changing zoning. So we'll see how that all plays out. Right. But they didn't make this case without having a, a pretty good legal footprint. There is precedent that they were relying upon, as well as the city relying upon a set of precedent. So us lawyers will kind of geek out and be interested. But in okay. the end, we just want to finish right. this. So we Unfortunately, know I'll translate that as to, since it's too close to call, it might take <laughs> a very long time. That's right. So if it was clear cut one way or the other, at least we'd have a result. So I, I wouldn't be surprised too if the city ends up appealing if they end up losing. 
So right. I'd expect that to be a timeline that drags on too. I think they really got their feet cemented in. They do not want to lose control of the ability to create the zoning. And the way the referendum came out was city council would be prevented for a full year before they'd be able to act on it. And so maybe by dragging out litigation, that provision would change and city council can get involved and actually help with corrective measure. But I think uh, for those of you looking to operate in Warren and or Detroit, our cautionary tale is they're both going to be moving forward and what that looks like in the end is still a little bit remains to be seen. I think it's fair to say Warren is probably closer than Detroit to getting there. I, you know, if we said three months, it wouldn't be surprising with all the have to read it on the records and those type of things that occur. Detroit, on the other hand, if it happens in this calendar year, that'd be a blessing. Well, and if you're from any of those surrounding municipalities and you're looking for some economic impact on your community, uh, there's going to be a lot less dispensaries in the city of Detroit very soon, and those patients are going to need products somewhere. So that's right. uh, you have places like Hazel Park, River Rouge, allowing a few dispensaries. Yeah. Uh, that's probably not going to be sufficient to, to satisfy the existing market that's there. So if you're working on some of those communities surrounding the city, uh, that's Great an advice. argument you need to bring up. People have a need for these products, and that need is going to be you know, difficult to satisfy under the, the system in the next few months, given the circumstances yeah. in two of our largest municipalities. Yeah, Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Lincoln Park, Allen Park, all those along the west side of the, the city, all the ones on the south side, if we get down into Wyandotte and you know, over down along Jefferson on the south side. Uh, you know, a lot of these cities, if you're looking to advocate to find new places, the fact that that market is frozen is that Travis is making a great point. Patient access is exposed. So patients are in need. I got texts from a few clients and well, other family friends today that were just like, I can't believe they're closed. Where do I go? What do I do? And so, you know, keeping that in mind is you want to use this to your advantage for advocacy elsewhere. And that if you're a, a great point. Right. And if you're a patient... It's time to talk to your communities. Like, why should you have to drive to these participating communities? It's the same situation it's always been. That's what used to be the case for everyone coming to Detroit, coming to Lansing, coming to Ann Arbor. Well, maybe the shoe's now on the other foot because of the way these municipalities, and they might not have any idea about this because marijuana is new for most of these municipalities. So you need to get out there and talk to your elected officials, explain to them professionally, elegantly, why this is important to you as a patient or you know, why this is important to their community, why this is an opportunity for their community. I mean, we're in a changing set of circumstances. There's going to be a rocky road along the way, but there's opportunity as well. Well, there, there's a, a common saying that I've heard in Michigan for a long time about our weather, which is, if you don't like it, wait a minute. <laughs> um, you know, I think it might be fair to say that what we don't like right now today, we're seeing an evolution in our state. We're seeing it grow. We're seeing communities that opted out in May and June of last year have now come back, put on their agenda. Some have opted in. There's a lot of communities taking action. Do your part. Talk to them. Be transparent. Don't try to hide behind anything. Go tell them what you want to do. Because the more transparent we are and the more they can realize how legitimate you are as a business person, the more likely they're wanting to buy into your program. So, well, that's our update for our two big cities. I'm sure we'll have a lot more to talk about next week. Um, the snowstorm kept us out last week, so we skipped a week. But we, and we day jobs to kept, us, kept yeah. us out this morning. So. It's been a very busy, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been a very busy week with the deadline and other things going on. But we'll keep at it. We'll keep bringing you new things uh, as it relates to medical marijuana laws here in Michigan. So for Craig Aronoff and Travis Copenhaver, thank you guys. Have a great weekend. See ya.